on behalf of Gitika Trust, I welcome everyone for the session we have organized today to mark the 80th year of Bengal famine of 1943. The years leading to independence and accompanying partition of India mark an era of political uncertainty, social turmoil, and collective violence in Bengal. The Second World War, the Bengal famine of 1943, and the Calcutta riots of 1946 were three major and interconnected crises that shaped the social, economic, and political context of pre-partition Bengal. Of the three, the 1943 Bengal famine has been subjected to denials, indifference, and administrative incompetence leading to highly consequential failures for the colonial administration. As for the historians of decolonization and nationalist struggle, the Bengal famine has been rather neglected. Inspection of the Bengal famine has been occasional or done in isolation and has been largely overlooked or sidetracked from the main course of events. Gitika Trust, in remembrance of this tragic event, attempts to revisit the Bengal famine in its 80th year through a series of lectures. Today's lecture is the third in this series, and I take great pleasure in welcoming and introducing Dr. Joanna Simono as the speaker for the day. Joanna is assistant professor in the Department of History of South Asia, Heidelberg University. She did her postdoctoral research in two universities, University of Vienna and Duisburg Essen University. Joanna has been awarded PhD from ETH Zurich and is also the recipient of the most pre prestigious ETH medal for outstanding doctoral thesis in the year 2020. She was consultant, humanitarian policy group, ODI London in 2014. She is a recipient of a long list of prizes, awards, and fellowships. Joanna has contributed book chapters and several articles in academic journals. Her forthcoming monograph in June 2023 is Ending Famine in India, a Transnational History of Food Aid and Development, 1890 to 1950. The Gitika Trust team was impressed by her article, The Great Bengal Famine in Britain, Metropolitan Campaigning for Food Relief and the End of Empire, where she studied how Indian nationalist associations based in Britain struggled to spread awareness about the 1943 Bengal famine among the British public and also to create increasing pressures on the British government to course correct colonial policies, although much delayed and limited in scope. Joanna also demonstrated the power of images or visual representations of the Bengal famine by the British press, thus accelerating debates and anti-famine campaigns. Without further delay, I would now hand it over to Joanna to take over and deliver the lecture. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sujata, for this very kind introduction and for the inv uh, invitation to speak uh, about the Bengal famine and to speak about my own research. Uh, I hope there was someone in the chat not happy about the screen. I hope that it works now and you can see everything and hear me well. Um, so you see um, the slide divided into two parts. On the right side, you see the title. So I would like to talk about... Um, the way literature, new publications on the Bengal famine has tried to push the boundaries of the history of the famine. And you see on the, on the left side, the agenda for today. So the first part is divided into two, um, yeah, two parts. I wanna first talk about how literature 
um, has tried to push the temporal boundaries of the history of the Bengal famine, and then about the spatial, the way it pushed the spatial boundaries. And this is not really a comprehensive um, review of literature because there is more and more that is being published and written about the Bengal famine, but at least I want to point to some very important uh, books that have come out in recent years. And then I want to talk about um, my own research. I would like to talk about the um, transnational mobilization of famine relief um, for Bengal. If you want to, I'm also admitting people, so sometimes I might seem a bit distracted, I admit all. That should be working. Um, so in the second part, because there are lots of organizations and persons who tried to mobilize relief for Bengal in the years 1943-44, um, I want to concentrate today for, for this talk on um, the participation involvement of Indian women's organizations. And I want to talk about women's organization in Bengal, a bit about Bombay, but then also turn to London to um, make some more additions to the article that I have written some years ago. And then there's also time for question and answers when I will try to answer your questions to the best of my knowledge. So in the last decade or so, let me see, can I move my slides? Yeah. So in the last decade or so, uh, the famine in Bengal has been increasingly delinked, disassociated from the year 1943. Of course, there have been earlier publications already since the 1980s who um, talked about how famine, how the famine did not start really in the year 1943, but at least in the year 1942. And I want to talk about that a bit, also to kind of rehearse um, the causes, some of the causes of famine, although this famine might not be in need of an introduction to you. So as early as 1982, Paul Greeno has argued that the cyclone which ravaged the coastal districts of Bengal and Orissa in mid-October 1942 could be taken as one important starting point of the famine. Especially in Midnapur, the storm affected a population that was already strained by the government's scorched earth campaign. After the fall of Burma in the spring of 1942, uh, Bengal's eastern districts and the coastal lines were turned into front lines of the Second World War. The fall of Burma raised the fear of uh, Japanese invasion. In mid-1942, the colonial authorities thereby therefore ordered the confiscation of boats and rice surpluses, which was meant to deny the Japanese invaders um, um, important resources. But in doing so, it also removed the sources of income of Bengals, agriculturalists and fishermen, and thereby contributed tragically to the making of the Bengal famine. The first effects of the policies showed in June 1942, when Indian army recruiters um, noticed a very sudden increase of the number of young men from the east of Bengal and commented on their miserable physical condition. So the office in charge had to find creative ways had to create um, actually breast camps where the male and undernourished recruits were restored to health prior to be actually be uh, in a position to be admitted to the um, army. Now the fall of Burma um, also meant the cessation of rice imports in the spring of 1942, which had early supplied Bengal, and now it could uh, no longer be relied on to balance local scarcities. The influx of large numbers of British and then also American soldiers into Bengal, who uh, were to fight in the Southeast Asian war theater, reduced the province's resources further. To accommodate um, troops, agricultural land had to be cleared and um, trains that had previously transported rice across district and provincial borders now primarily moved soldiers. So all of these factors, these different um, causes of famine, um, contribute to the making of famine, they put pressure on the economy of, of, of Bengal, um, and they contribute to a sharp increase of um, commodity prices. The commodity market was largely left unregulated, the ill-fated attempts of the government to then um, hoard buy rice contributed to further to inflation. So um, there has been long discussions about whether there was actually a um, lack of uh, food in the province, or whether um, if you go what um, with those who who have um, read and agreed to Amartya Sen, there was actually a, a lack of uh, purchasing power, and there was actually enough enough food in the province, but because it was left to the 
um, black market and was hoarded. Um, and due to the uh, inflation, um, the most of the people of Bengal actually could not afford to buy food. Um, now, rather than um, discussing more the sources or causes of famine, and there's a lot been written about and lots of really intense debates still going on, I want to um, shift to a new publication, um, which has further kind of pushed the temper boundary, has spoken out in favor of extending the time frame used to uh, study the Bangor famine beyond 1942 by going further back in time. And that was uh, Jana Mukherjee's book, um, War, Famine, and the End of Empire, in which Mukherjee has emphasized the need to de-link the uh, Bengal famine from the year 1943. On the one hand, he argues that famine is not an event, but a slowly evolving process, um, which is embedded in the political and the social and the economic um, structures of societies. And on the other hand, he contends that the Bengal famine was the result of the impoverishment of Bengal's countryside that began at least a decade early, earlier, so already in the 1930s. More important than Mukherjee's predating the onset of the famine is his reference to the longevity of famine conditions, which indeed dragged on for years. According to Jana Mukherjee, the economic and social dislocation of large parts of Bengal are an important prelude to the communal violence of 1946. So famine, according to him, and this is quite plausible, determined the socioeconomic context of the riots of 1946, which is, according to Jana Mukherjee, often too easily dismissed in the literature that strives to explain the extent of violence erupting in Calcutta in 1946. So the connection between famine and um, the great Calcutta killings has also been flagged by um, Anvesha Roy, um, who has written this book that you see here on the screen. It's called Making Peace and Making Riots. And she has a chapter on the Bengal famine in which she, she explores um, the way political parties, in particular the Hindu Mahasabha and the Muslim League, exploited famine relief to nourish and harden communal identities and thereby fed into communal uh, violence. And um, to add to this, Abhijit Sarkar is another uh, scholar who I think has a forthcoming book about um, communalism and famine. And he also published an article that you might know and have read already about the way um, famine relief was used to nourish communal identities. Now, by linking famine to communal violence, historians um, have embedded the Bengal famine more firmly into the history of uh, the Indian subcontinent, but also um, in the history of decolonization in South Asia. I would also like to include a third and last publication in this category of literature that pushes the temporal boundaries of the history of the Bengal famine. So in Hungry Nation, Food, Famine, and the Making of Modern India, the historian Benjamin Siegel traces India's post-colonial food politics to the Bengal famine. So his first chapter is about the Bengal famine, which is kind of his starting point. Um, and he shows how um, the, because of the herring experience of the famine, um, the famine became an important part of linking colonialism to the end of famine. Um, and so he takes it as a starting point to then discuss post-colonial food politics. So here again, you see how famine is not again, because as uh, Sujata has pointed out brilliantly in her introduction, it has often been studied as an isolated event that receives lots of attention from scholars specialized on famine, but it has rarely been used or uh, explored in connection to um, for instance, the histories of Bengal in the 1940s, and this has been changing. Now let's move into, uh, let's move on to how histories, how historians recently have also pushed the uh, spatial boundaries of the history of the Bengal famine. The agrarian historian Mark Targa, amongst others, has helped to understand how the history of the Bengal famine is linked to the history of famine and hunger in India in the 1940s. Although the Bengal famine, if, if you compare it to other famines and scarcities, 
in India in the 1940s. It remains clearly unmatched in its scale and in its tragedy. It was part of a broader spectrum of hunger and poverty that affected India in these years. At the outbreak of the Second World War, parts of the Punjab, for instance, were already in the midst of a food crisis. And even though fish relief was mobilized already in December 1938, famine conditions were visible well into the year uh, 1941 and produced alarming, alarming accounts of scurvy and rickets that we can trace in, in um, for instance, medical journals pu published at that time. The people of Travancore and Cochin in southwest India were plagued by famine in the years 1941 to 44. Food shortages left the poorer classes starving, and those who were still able to fill their stomachs partially suffered malnutrition. The hunger drove about 15,000 Travancoreans up north to British Malabar, where they squatted in camps that remained largely unaided. In the meantime, in, in Buja, Bijapur, uh, in, in the Bombay province, the failure of seasonal rains in September and October 1942 also led to famine. Famine was officially declared in December of the same year, but the provincial government was consumed by the task to provide food rationing in the city of Bombay. So in a country where the economy was geared to meet the needs of the nation at war, the provision of relief for rural populations who had no direct relevance for the smooth functioning of the war machinery, according to their colonial mindset, it turned into a second, secondary concern at best. If we consider how the literature has tried to expand the boundaries of the history of the Bengal famine, we may also include uh, Madhusri Mukherjee's book, Churchill's Secret War, in this category of research. Mukherjee begins her book with a quote from Churchill in which he claims that India suffered the least from the war of all countries and that, was, that India was carried through the battle on the shoulders of the British island. In the history of the Second World War um, that Churchill published in 1950, Churchill does not mention the deployment of two million Indian soldiers in the British service, nor does he mention the Bengal famine. So Mukherjee focus on, focuses on the political decisions reached in the war cabinet in, in Britain, um, led by Churchill, to scrutinize the ignorance of British politicians towards the suffering of the people of Bengal. And she shows how British policy prioritized the British war effort while accepting the death of millions in Bengal. In doing so, she has added insight on the lack of political will to assist Indians, but also had to better link the famine in Bengal to the history of the Second World War, which is also an important um, part of emerging literature that you um, embed it more firmly in the history of the, of the Second World War. Apart from turning the gaze to Britain, other scholars have also looked at what was going on in, um, in the US at that time and uh, have looked in particular at the responses of Indian political organization in the US, who in 1943 and 44 tried to influence public opinion in favor of sending food to India. In a recent article titled One Man Lobby, Propaganda, Nationalism in the Diaspora and the Indian League of America during the Second World War, Dinya Patel discusses how Indians in the US were not sitting by while Bengal's population was starved, but indeed tried to lobby for food relief and also tried to influence the um, work and the policies of the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration that was currently concentrating on rehabilitating war-torn Europe. Now, my own research um, on the Bengal famine also tries to kind of push the temporal and spatial limits that undergird histories of the Bengal famine, but also histories of famine in India. Um, so my research on the Bengal famine has been part of my aim to learn about the transformation of the political and the scientific responses to famine in colonial India from the late 19th century to the early 1950s. So I also include the first years of the Indian post-colonial state. In that regard, I've tried to situate the Bengal famine more firmly in the history of colonial South Asia, as well as also in the history of food aid and developments. So lots of histories about um, food aid of the age of development have been written um, by totally excluding 
uh, South Asia. So I try to also link these historiographies. So my forth forthcoming book, and you're really the first ones to see uh, the book cover, which was just sent to me by the publisher. Um, I um, also try to show how Indian exiles and immigrants in the US, as well in Britain, have responded to famines in India by raising money, by raising awareness. And this happened already in the from the early 20th century onwards, but it um, reached an unprecedented scale in the context of the Bengal famine because of the political networks that have been built in the preceding years. Now let me turn to my second part of the presentation, the transnational mobilization of famine relief during the Bengal famine. I want to start with a word of caution. I do not want to, um, by focusing on what has actually been done to assist those um, starving in Bengal, the population of Bengal, I do not want to gloss over the massive violence inflicted on the people of Bengal, and I don't want to paint a more hopeful picture um, that shows that despite all the horror and ignorance and the neglect, there were still organizations and individuals who reached out a helping hand. I think it is very important to consider that famine relief also served um, an agenda. It often served um, political purposes by supporting the famine affected population. Political organizations, for instance, wanted to rally their constituencies, they expanded their influence and they demonstrated their power. Being able to help those affected by famine also always means being in a privileged position. Thus, Indian commercial elites were able to engage in philanthropy because they had become richer on the backs of laborers. So what I try to do is to offer a critical perspective on the motivations for engaging in famine relief. In terms of the context of the emerging um, national, transregional, transnational response to famine in Bengal, it's very important to um, look at the um, way information was disseminated. I want to actually show you this slide. Um, so due to censorship and the disruption of communication during the war, there was a lack of timely and adequate information about the famine. The British colonial government aiming um, to uh, avoid that resources are actually used in famine relief and also believing that Japan would exploit the famine and advance into Indian territory, it instructed the chief press advisor in Bengal to censor press reports on the famine using, for instance, euphemisms just like the food situation. And famously, in late August 1943, the English language newspaper, The Statesman, managed to get, to get drastic images of the famine past the chief press advisor, because the rules applied to censor the press had been silent about photographs, a gap which the statement exploited. And here on the right side, um, excuse the bad quality, but that was actually a scan of microfilm. Um, you see some of the first images that um, the statesman published. Now, historians have concentrated on the role of the statesman and its editor, Ian Stevens, in bringing the famine to international attention, but they have overlooked how the publication unfolded a dynamic in Bengal itself. So in late August 1943, days after the images of the statesman had appeared, um, the press advisor, when he tried to censor a statement about the famine by the Hindu Mahasabha leader Shyama Prasad Mukherjee, faced unprecedented opposition. The president of the Indian Social Service Organization, the Servants of India Society, which had always been close to the Congress, uh, immediately brought a motion before the Bengal Legislative Assembly to lament the lack of uniformity of censorship. And he declared that the censoring of Mukherjee's statement was an injustice. And all the Mukherjee, of course, was a vociferous in his critique of the Bengal government that was, um, and as such, of the Muslim League ministry. Not even representatives of the Muslim League welcomed the ban of Mukherjee's statement on famine. The parties agreed at that time that the press censor was unjust. 
And only a few days after the famous publication of the Statesman, the Amrita Bazar Patrika then also ran a first series of images um, of the famine and thereby contributed to render the crisis visible to a wider Indian audience beyond Bengal. Now the drastic accounts of famine, in particular the pictures that were shown, the photographs, provided the national and international press in the last month of 1943, um, provided in the press allowed then those in favor of assisting the population in Bengal um, to put pressure on their governments, on the British and also on the US government. Now, the result is well known. In October, the newly appointed Viceroy Wavell eventually called for the army to drive food into Calcutta and rural Bengal. Army convoys arrived in November 43 and provided um, much needed food and medical relief. The aid drive, however, um, was severely delayed and it also ended prematurely. In the end of 1943, the Viceroy and Bengal's government were quick to announce the end of famine. So the national and international media response that unfolded in the very last month of 1943 facilitated the work of non-state relief providers in Bengal, who, because of the public awareness, found greater receptiveness um, of their peers uh, for assistance, and they received help now from outside of the province. So the chronology of the event seemingly provide historical evidence for the role of the free press in pressuring political elites to assist populations affected by famine. However, at the time news broke due to the many personal and organizational networks that linked Bengal to the outside world, information had indeed been permeating the colonial curtain of denial and censorship. There were organizations who provided relief in the province already prior to uh, this international media response. Um, among them were the relief committees that worked under the auspices of the Hindu Mahasabha and the Communist Party of India, and they were among the, the largest contributors to famine relief. But there were also smaller efforts of the Ramakrishna Mission, the Brahma Samaj, the Mavari Society, the Kaksa Movement. British Quakers were trying to assist the starving. Servants of India Society had sent a handful of volunteers. And all these efforts and resources were really outstripped by the needs of the population, which required a resp response of the colonial government, the only relief provider who could have prevented the death of millions. So it's always important to um, take into consideration that in terms of the sources that were mobilized, these were really um, small scale marginal efforts, but I still argue it's important part of the history of the Bengal famine that we need to include. So coming to um, organizations um, organizing relief in uh, Bengal. The Mahila Atma Raksha Samiti, abbreviated as Mars, um, was founded in 1942 and it became one of the most important um, relief organizations um, and women's organization providing relief. Mars was held by the Communist Party of India, which at the time promoted the formation of women's organizations. Um, but um, despite of that support of the Communist Party of India, there were still uh, many uh, members of the party, male members, who continued to oppose this official policy. Mass operated independently of the Communist Party of India, and yet it was closely entangled with the party. Mars then, during the famine, attended to the special needs of women who, apart from hunger, often suffered from sexual violence. Alongside conventional famine relief, such as food and medical aid, Mars also trained women in self-defense. Uh, they raised awareness for violence committed against women, they prevented sex work and the trafficking of women and children. To this end, Mars placed volunteers in shops to prevent the manhandling of the women in queues and to help them collect a legitimate quota. They also rescued women and girls who had been sold into prostitution. In July, um, 1943, as migration from rural Bengal to Calcutta peaked, Mars opened canteens um, in the city to provide meals at subsidized prices or free of cost, and they rent milk centers that fed about around 12,000 women and children daily. And you see on the on this um, slide um, 
some of the volunteers of mass doling out aid. In August 1943, uh, Mass initiated the Bangor's Bangor Women Food Committee, which funded the efforts of 14 smaller women's organizations in the province. Later, in April 1944, it shifted to the task of rebuilding women's livelihoods. For this purpose, it assembled more than a dozen social service organizations in the Nari Sevasang, which operated shelters where women received vocational training. So the famine relief work of Mars intensified its appeal to women in Bengal and turned it into a mass movement. In early 1944, Mars claimed then a membership of 40,000 women from different social strata, classes and castes. The formation of Mars shows that the famine in Bengal was a catalyst for the Indian women's movement. This is um, also one way we can, we can again build a link um, between the famine and the um, history, the broader history of um, social and political history of the province. Now, as Annie Devonish, amongst others, has argued, women's various experiences of the economic and social dis upheaval and dislocation in Bengal galvanized women's political mobilization. Many women in the province organized themselves into new organization that raised now awareness for the special needs and also the rights of women and children. The political activities of women in Bengal in the 1940s led to a significant diversification of the women's movement, which had long been dominated by middle and upper class women. Um, this diversification and much to the um, work of mass and the appeal and the, and the success it had in enlist the support of women from different social backgrounds. Although Mars defined itself as a women's social service organization, its proximity to communi communism embedded it firmly in the political aspirations of the Communist Party of India, which affected the way its members advocated for women's rights and women's position in Indian society. So since the Soviet entry in the Second World War, communist organizations in India mobilized women against the anticipated arrival of Japanese invaders by raising anxieties um, of gendered violence. Mars and CPI tapped into well-established symbolism that equated the woman with the nation and placed the protection of women's honor at the heart of India's national defense. So Cromier's writing on women's endangered sexual purity and their need to arm themselves against Japanese invaders were not limited to Bengal, but can also be found in Punjab, in Madras, and Andhra Pradesh. In Andhra Pradesh, where Japanese air raids um, in April 42 made the diffuse threat of a Japanese advance tangible, communists organized special trainings in schools for young women. And you can see uh, a picture again, I apologize for the bad quality uh, of women training um, in physical education at the um, school organized by a communist organization. Apart from lessons in self-defense, the training for women offered a set of skills that modern women um, should master. Lessons included political education, trainings in, um, training in public speaking, as well as singing lessons. The training also educated young women in the principles of maternity, child welfare, personal hygiene, and sanitation to make them, I quote, better as mothers and housewives. And this emphasis on women's domestic duties alongside their engagement with public political forums occurred more than once. In early 1943, Mars organized women's hunger marches in Bengal. And in the People's War, um, one um, of the important publication of the Communist Party of India, Renu Chakravati depicted women's political mobility political um, mobilization as conjuring with the maternal and conjugal obligations. So the reason why women left their home was to claim food for their families, which meant that they kept with their role as mothers and wives as pivots of the household. Now, Mars was clearly at the forefront um, of women's involvement in feminine relief work in Bengal, but it was not the only women's organization participating in such work, nor were women visibly active only in Bengal. 
1940, when the um, Communist Party of India was still illegal, more and more communist women had joined the All India Women's Conference. Mars and the All India Women's Conference worked closely together for several years, although the political divide between the Indian National Congress, closely associated with the All India Women's Conference, and the CPI that was more closely or ideologically linked to Mars seemed insurmountable. It was then only in, the, in 1946 that the All India Women's Conference began to lament the growing influence of communist women, leading to rising tensions and the withdrawal of communists from the All India Women's Conference. But during the famine, the All India Women's Conference and Mars um, had a small but important overlap in members that enabled women from Bengal to actually flag the needs of women in Bengal in the fora of the All India Women's Conference. So information about the famine then moved through um, the networks, um, through the person institution networks between Mars and the All India Women's Conference. So the All India Women's Conference maintained a network of branches across India and women activists disseminated information about the famine in Bengal through these networks. Naturally, the All India Women's branches in Bengal were the first to respond to famine. And they did so already in 1943, in April 1943, when uh, in Bankura and Kakuta, they opened clinics, milk kitchens and relief centers. They also appealed to families across India to adopt children rendered destitute by the famine and set up a foster parent scheme that allowed Indians to pay for the food, shelter and education of orphaned children without actually taking them then into their homes. Reports about the food situation in the province uh, filtered through to the All India Women's Central Assembly in Bombay in early 43. The All India Women's President Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit visited Bengal then in September 1943, a visit that has been delayed because of her incarceration, because of her support for the Congress and the Quit India movement. By late September and early October, however, her accounts of the plight of women and children were taken up by the national and international press and added uh, visible momentum to the mobilization of funds that were already underway for Bengal. So we can see how in October 1943, the All India Women's Conference branch in Srinagar organized an aid drive that raised funds by, by means of house-to-house -house collections, charity concerts and festivals with the result that 500 tons of grain were dispatched from Lahore to Kakota. By November, money was also coming forth from the India League's Famine Relief Committee in London. And it's London where I wanna turn to next. Despite the early efforts of Indian national associations in Britain to attract attention to famine in India, only occasionally did reports on the food situation make it into the columns of British dailies. In conjunction with censorship, the lack of um, awareness in Britain for events in India was considerably facilitated by the fact that the press was busy say, selling the daily horrors of the war. In addition, the reports of human tragedies in war torn Europe had filled the news in Britain, and they fully consumed the attention of philanthropists and humanitarians who struggled to counter the persuasive, persuasiveness of total war rhetoric. India, it seems, was temporarily removed from public debates in Britain and only resurfaced in British dailies in the end of September 1943 with the publication of a first series of reports from the famine affected districts. For Indian nationalists and the British left, the proliferation of reports, articles and images by English owned and widely circulated newspapers gave uh, credibility to their claims and they, they very quickly reproduced these photographs in their own um, publications and you can see here photographs that were first published in the Indian in the in the statesman from Krakota, and they were here used by the Indian Freedom Campaign in order to not only ask for food aid but also for the release of um, Indians um, Congress politicians. Indian nationalism had prospered in Britain from the early 20th century through the exchanges of members from 
the diasporic Indian community and British um, anti-imperialists, whose cooperation at its outset was considered a major destabilizing force in the empire. The political activism of Indians in Britain, who had come to the metropole since the um, mid 19th century already, was decisively nourished by the everyday experience of racial and colonial hierarchies and sustained by the accelerating Indian nationalist movement in India itself. The latter deliberately targeted the metropole to increase pressure on the colonial structure. And due to the growing demands of labor during the Second World War, we also had an increase of um, South Asian um, laborers coming to, coming to Britain, but still, it was still a numeric minority. This was also divided by class and education with an intellectual elite that was in touch with contemporary life in Britain and a large group of um, manual laborers. Um, who really struggled to make a living in the metropole, um, often living in the port cities. A few eminent personalities sought to transcend the boundaries and to unite the Indian working class and the elite in their struggle against colonialism. And one such example was VK Krishna Menon. I think I have a picture of him here. Yeah. Um, who would go on to hold a series of not notable offices, as you know, in Indian Britain after independence. In 1943, British authorities were deeply aware of his political potential and they tried to slow him down and um, carefully watched him. Menon had attracted the attention of Scotland Yard for his role in nourishing and organizing Indian nationalist sentiments in Britain. In 1930, he had founded the India League, which quickly became a meeting place for Indian and British anti-colonialists. And the India League first um, benefited from the endorsement of the Indian National Congress, which bestowed the Indian League with uh, the status of a liaison between nationalist, the nationalist movement in India and sympathizers of Indian um, self in Britain. Soon after its inception, the India League successfully enlisted the support of British liberal politicians, public figures, and drawing on Maynard's well-established networks to political parties and working class organizations. Very quickly, the India League expanded from London to various cities across Britain. And in the 1940s, it um, received a lot of support from the Communist Party of Great Britain, which channeled lots of uh, personnel, but also money into the India League, which really put it in a unique position to now use these ties and money to advertise and advocate for famine relief in Britain. So unlike other Indian political organizations in the UK, the India League organized uh, material family. It did not only wrote about famine, and uh, accused the British colonial state of not doing enough, it also tried to mobilize material relief. Other organizations such as the Swaraj House or the India Freedom Campaign concentrated on putting political pressure. The India League, of, uh, India League in London created the India Relief Committee, which attracted substantial support in Britain throughout the crisis. As an offshoot of the India League, the committee could build on the League's network to establish local family relief subcommittees in cities across Britain. The committee appeared to the public through the India League's mouthpiece News India, through pamphlets, um, various meetings, rallies it organized, um, and conferences in the country. The donations solicited in Britain were then sent to India and distributed under the supervision of the Communist and General Secretary of the Indian Trade Union Congress, N.M. Joshi, to a series of local relief agencies, including the All India Women's Conference. The core group of the India Relief Committee uh, consisted of Krishna Menon, but also of Mudbranch Anand and the Welsh politician Clement Davis. And there were also um, important British Quakers who were part of the organization. What, um, when I wrote this article, I was not really aware of yet, but I included this in my um, forthcoming book, is that Indian women played a very important part at that moment in London as well, in highlighting or helping the India League to um, speak about the famine and to mobilize laborers, um, which links then the um, increasing, accelerating Indian women's movement in Bengal and in India also back to, to London. 
So in June 1943, already in June, Asha Bhattacharya opened the inaugural meeting of the India League's East London branch office with a speech that blamed the short-sighted policy of the British government for the current famine conditions in India. Bhattacharya's audience included a group about, of about 18 Indian factory workers and seafarers who had come to listen to the India League. Before the India League's longtime president, Krishna Menon and Mukraj Anand rose to, rose, rose to speak, uh, Jai Kishori Handu addressed the audience. So another woman, Indian woman who was invited to speak, normally it would first be uh, Krishna Menon and others who would speak and then maybe women. Now it was really women who dominated this gathering. So Handu spoke in Urdu. She drew further attention to the famine conditions in Bengal. And um, she questioned the willingness of Indian seafarers to actually risk their lives bringing food to Britain, while in the meantime, their families in Bengal were starving. In her efforts to rally Indian seafarers behind the Indian League that continued throughout the following month, uh, Handu referred frequently to the famine in Bengal. In October 43, she shocked a group of Indians who had just returned from North America with reports of Indians starving to death on the streets of Calcutta and called, called the man uh, actually to action. At this time, the famine in Bengal had made it into the headlines of British newspapers and Indian women in, um, organized in the Indian League were now trying to translate articles um, in Bengali and Urdu for Indian uh, seafarers and British port cities to read and to listen to. Indian women in Britain had long supported the India League. They had joined the meetings and they took part in, in the activities. Their voices, however, suddenly acquired greater visibility in March 43, after Menon's attempts at winning the support of, the, of Indian dock workers and seafarers in the east of London resulted in the formation of the India League's Women Committee. For the task of mobilizing Indian laborers, Menon, who was perceived as elitist and lacked the language skills required to address his audiences in a more personal tone, depended on women like Handu and Bhattacharya. The women were fluent in Bengali and Urdu and seemingly found greater acceptance among Indian workers. The current famine conditions in Bengal, as well as in the south of India, gave these women then a very powerful topic that assisted them in gaining the attention of Indian workers. So what this shows then is how women's personal and institutional networks um, carried information from Bengal to Bombay and London, which was part of a larger web of entanglements that subverted colonial censorship, the colonial censorship regime, and actually allowed information about the famine to circulate, and then also allowed the mobilization of famine relief. It assured that deta details about the famine in India would, amongst others, filter through to Britain, where Indian nationalists, British socialists and communists, as well as pacifists, aim to raise awareness for the plight of people in the province and to mobilize funds and food despite of and against the inertia of states and governments. And I'm going to end on this note. Thank you.